Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We stand in honor of your word and we receive your word to be written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, we'll be a doer of it, and we know that you will perform it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to be sharing with you on the subject of how to receive the blessings of God in your life. God wants you to be blessed. In Acts chapter 3, and verse 26, Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, who came and paid the price, he sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. He came to bring forth not only the redemption, but also to bless you. God wants you blessed. He wants to bring blessings in all areas of your life. We see God is the blesser. We look at the scriptures. We see that he blessed the living creatures. We see that he blessed man. He blessed man when he made male and female. He blessed individuals continually throughout the Word of God. He is the blesser, and he wants to bless you in all ways. Well, if we're going to be blessed, we've got to understand what his Word says. Over in Joshua, in chapter 8, Joshua in chapter 8, verse 34. Here he said that all Israel and the elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark, and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before, that they should bless the people of Israel. They're to be blessed. And who's spiritual Israel today? It's the church. And what did he do for them to be able to be blessed? Afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. We've got to know the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Word of God, so that we can know what he requires of us in order to see his blessings. We, of course, must know the blessings, the promises, all the things that belong to us. If we don't know the Word, how are we ever going to receive the blessings? If we don't know the word, how are we ever going to know all what is required of us, what he is responsible for us to do in order to see the blessings? See, the blessings just don't come on you out of nowhere without you carrying out the will of God and doing the things that he says. When you are born again, you've come into a covenant relationship with God. In covenant relationship, God has his part to play. You and I have our part to play. We have our responsibilities and of course, he has his responsibilities. You and I must learn of his word and walk in his ways in order to see the blessings of God come to us. We see over in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Abraham walked in those steps of the God kind of faith. And those that are of faith will be blessed, it says, with faithful Abraham. We see in verse 14, he declares, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. All the blessings of the old covenant that were the blessings of Abraham will come on us through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. We see this because of the fact that we know that this promise, as it says in verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. The promises were made to Abraham and also his seed. Who's the seed? Notice he said, saith not, and to seeds as of many. He's not talking about seeds down the line. He's talking about one seed. One and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promise came to Abraham and to his seed. And so that seed is Jesus Christ. Well, when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, we have his spirit within us, and we are in that same position as the seed. It says in, Abraham, in Galatians 3.29, If you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. You receive Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. God wants you to be blessed. He wants the blessings of God to come on you and manifest in your life. Now you must understand, that these are spiritual blessings first. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath 
blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice this, past tense, hath blessed us. That means they already belong to you legally in Christ by what Jesus has done for us. You have to do some things, though, in line with the Word to experientially receive them. There's two aspects to the work of God. One, what He's already done through Jesus Christ, legally in the work of redemption. Two, what He does experientially in our life as we act upon the Word of God to see them manifest. <coughs> and notice it says that there's all spiritual blessings. These blessings are spiritual blessings that belong to us. And notice where are they? They're in heavenly places, in Christ. You're in Christ. The new covenant is the document where they're recorded. Where's the new covenant? It's up in heaven. And now, you and I can receive all the blessings of God that belong to us according to the spiritual law of the new covenant. All these blessings are ours. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God are yea and in him amen. Those promises are ours. And we need to do what he says in order to see these spiritual blessings that he already legally has blessed us with come into manifestation because they don't just come on you just because you're born again until you have met the conditions. And this is a very important point. Many people talk about blessings and they give you a scripture or two and just think that all these blessings should come upon you and then so many people say, well, where's the blessings? I haven't seen them come. Well, that's because the Bible shows us all of the conditions that are shown and as we meet the conditions, then all these blessings will come on you and overtake you in your life. And we're going to be going through the Word of God in the Old Testament, which are all pointing towards types of what we do in the New Testament, as well as New Testament scriptures, showing the conditions for receiving these blessings in our life. Because as you do what God wants you to do, He will respond with bringing blessings to you. And we're also then, we'll be looking at the results, all these blessings that will come upon you in area after area of your life. We begin back in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 8. In verse 20. Genesis 8 verse 20, after Noah came out of the ark, it says, He builded an altar unto the Lord. He took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. He was worshiping Him, bringing a sacrifice unto the Lord. You and I are to be praisers and worshipers of God. You know, now we are to bring a spiritual sacrifice unto Him, a praise and worship unto the Lord. If we won't praise and worship Him, why should his blessings come upon us? He expects us to do that. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. This is referring to the sacrifice that was given unto God that he accepted. And the Lord said in his heart, I'll not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Either will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. What was the response that Noah brought as he was delivered from the flood? He worshiped God. As he worshiped God, then what was God's response? He blessed him. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill the earth. God wants us to be a worshiper of him. That's why we come and we minister unto the Lord and then He ministers back unto us. As you praise and worship Him with all your heart and you do this daily, you're going to see that God is going to minister back unto you in your life. In Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, here's where Abraham was tempted and tested by God to take his son up to Mount Moriah and offer him there for a sacrifice. Of course, he provided the lamb which was pointing towards Jesus, who was going to be the Lamb of God, who was going to take away the sin of the world for us, and he was, of course, going to be the substitute. Well, we see that because of what happened, here's what God says to him. The angel of the Lord called out of, to Abraham out of heaven the second time, and he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing... I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed, speaking of Christ, which is also speaking of us, remember, because you and I are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise, possess the gate of his enemies, which means we can defeat our enemies in our life. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's through Jesus. Why? 
because thou hast obeyed my voice. Obedience was the key. In order to see these blessings be released and come to pass, he had to obey. You've got to realize that you and I must obey the Lord if we're going to see God bring forth his blessings in our life. Over in Genesis chapter 26, in verse 2, it says, first of all, there was a famine. And in verse 2, the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not, go not down into Egypt. He says to Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I will tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I'll be with thee, and will bless thee. He had to obey. He had to do the things that he was supposed to do. And notice he says, don't go down to Egypt. What is Egypt a type of in Scripture? Egypt is a type of the world. If you go to the ways of the world as your source instead of God, you have actually made the world an idol. You've made it a source other than God. Why would God bless you as your source if you look to the world as your source? It's not going to happen. We find this as a problem in the body of Christ. People look to the world as much their source and then try God in whatever way they can and hope that maybe he'll come through. No, we need to put the Lord as our total source. He's your source. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. He's your provider. He's your one who's your peace. He's the one that will meet every need in your life. He is the one that you need to look to. So here, he's told him to sojourn in this land and I'll be with thee. Not in whatever land you want, but in the land that he set for us. And he'll bless thee. And he said unto thee and to thy seed, again, speaking of Christ, which also is speaking of us, I will give all these countries will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And he goes on and says, And I'll make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give, give unto thy seed all these countries, and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Blessings come because he obeyed. And we see in verse 5, he even makes the statement again, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That is why he was blessed. In like manner, because you obey the voice of the Lord, you keep his charge, his commands, his statutes, his laws. We're under the laws of the New Testament, remember, not of the Old Testament. The law has changed. We're now under the law of Christ, the law in the New Testament. We are to walk according to his New Testament commandments. Then you will see the blessings will come upon you. Down in verse 24, Genesis 26, he says, The Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not. And of course, this is when there was all types of strife that was going on, and the herdsmen were striving against Isaac's herdsmen. There were lots of problems going on. And what did God say? Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. We cannot be in fear over what is going on in the world or what is going on in circumstances. Fear is the opposite of faith. You get in fear, you'll shut down your faith and from God being able to manifest his blessings. Fear not. Don't be afraid of the devil or anything that he is bringing against you. He says that he's with you, he will bless you, and he is going to bring his promises to pass in your life. We see another scripture in Genesis 28. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. You can't be taking a spouse from someone who is not of the Lord. When you marry, you marry someone in the Lord. You don't marry someone outside of the Lord. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. He said, You don't take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paden Aram, in the house of Bethuel. Thy mother's father, take thee away from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee. You obey, God will bless you. He'll make thee fruitful, multiply thee, and you'll be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land. You want to inherit the promises that belong to you? We've got to do what God says. Is that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. We can't allow ourselves to disobey God. Remember what happened to Solomon? Solomon had all this great wisdom and all this great riches and blessings from God. And yet, then he went after all these women that he had no business being with whatsoever and took wives of all these, and they turned his heart away from the Lord. And the Lord was angry with him. He made a great mistake. And he had such great wisdom. How he could do that is amazing in light of the wisdom and the blessing that God had brought to him. Make sure that you don't take 
a spouse from the ites, from those that are not of the Lord. Also, you don't want to partner with people that are not of the Lord. You want to be sure that you are doing things and being pure before the Lord. You don't want anything to turn your heart away from God. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 27, Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if thou have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Notice. He learned by experience, seeing what God had done in his life and saw how God's blessing came upon him. One of the things you're going to learn, you're going to learn by experience how God brings blessings in other people's lives. You see how it will work in your life. That's why we need to be doers of the word. And you're going to learn by experience as you grow up and you gain spiritual understanding and wisdom of what God expects of you and what, will be, what is necessary to see the blessings of God come forth. Experience means you're going to be hearing and doing the Word. You're going to be observing what other people who are walking in line with the Word, how God is bringing the blessings, which is going to be an encouragement unto you. Over in Genesis, chapter 39, we see here in verse 5, speaking about Joseph. It came to pass that the time, from the time that he'd made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and the field. That was because of Joseph. See, Joseph was a blessed man. But why was Joseph, Joseph blessed? What was the reason why Joseph, Joseph was blessed over the rest of them? Well, you've got to understand something. In Genesis 49, verse 25, here in the blessing that was pronounced upon all the different sons, or else the, the statements that were made of the problems in their life, where he was pronouncing them over all those 12 sons. He says, Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast of the womb. This is what he was saying. This is going back to Joseph, who was a fruitful bow, fruitful. And here he's speaking of these great blessings that were going to come upon him. Why did the blessings come upon him and not on the others? He says, The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. What was it about him? He was separate from his brethren. He wasn't like his brethren. His brethren just did whatever they wanted to do. But this one, he was separate. In fact, the word separate is the word, if you notice in the lower window, where we can bring up the Hebrew word, it is number 5139, which corresponds with Strong's Concordance. And is this word, Nazir, which means a consecrated or devoted one. It means a Nazarite. He was a Nazarite. It's translated Nazarite 12 of the 16 times in the usage. You have to understand that he was a Nazarite. A Nazarite is a consecrated, devoted, separated one unto God to walk in the ways of the Lord. And you've got to realize you and I are Nazarites. We are to be the same way. Unfortunately, in the New Testament, they haven't done a good job of translating some things. And in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, remember Jesus was a Nazarite, separated unto God. And here it speaks of when they were speaking against Paul. And it says, we found this man, speaking of Paul, who was leader of the Christians, a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Well, who is he a, le a ringleader of, or a leader of? Of the ch Christians. Are Christians, were they Nazarenes? No. They didn't have anything to do with Nazar being from Nazareth whatsoever. A sect of the word Nazarenes actually is a word which was translated Nazarene, but it really is a word which means Nazarite. One separated. Christians are spiritual Nazarites, ones that are separated unto the Lord. That's why Joseph was blessed. If you're going to be blessed of the Lord, you've got to be separate from the things of this world. You've got to be separate from the things that are not of God. You've got to be separated, consecrated, devoted unto the Lord, and put him first place and be a doer of his word in your life. In Exodus chapter 23, Exodus 23, we pick up down here in verse 20. He said, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, 
and to bring thee into the place that I prepared. You know, the angels of God have been sent forth to minister for us the heirs of salvation, says in Hebrews chapter 1. The angels of God will go forth, they hearken to the voice of the word, and when you pray, the angels will go forth to perform the word in your life. Well, he says he sent this angel to keep thee in the way, to bring thee to the place that I have prepared. He said at the same time, beware of him and obey his voice, because what was the angel doing? He was speaking the word of God to him. They needed to obey the word. Provoke him not, for he's not going to pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. God doesn't wink his eye at sin anymore. He commands men everywhere to repent. If thou shalt indeed obey his voice, if, notice that. That's the condition, isn't it? We see if all over the word of God, don't we? That's telling us our part. If you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. What does God expect of us? He expects us to obey his voice and do all that he speaks. We can't play pick and choose with the word of God. I've seen too many people, too many Christians over the years, and even since we've been here, since we've come in this last year to start the church here, I've seen so many people that are pick and choose. They, they like what they like, and then when it comes to something that they don't like, they, they resist it and then they vanish or whatever all. Those are people that are not submitted to the word. No, he says, do all that I speak if you want him to be an enemy to your enemies, an adversary to your adversaries. My angel will go before thee and bring thee in unto all these different ites, because you're going to face every, these are all type of the evil spirits that you're going to deal with in your life, and you're going to cast them out and drive them out of every area. He goes on in verse 25, he says, you're going to serve the Lord your God, and you shall bless thy water and thy bread and thy water, and I'll take sickness away from the midst of thee. But what do we need to do? We've got to serve him. We can't just think that, well, I'm just going to pray and everything will be gone, but I don't serve him, I serve self, and I just do whatever I want to do. No, it doesn't work that way. We can't eliminate parts of the scripture and try to take these one wonderful promises. Thank you, God, for taking away sickness from the midst of me. Well, how about the serving part? Well, you know, if you serve in self, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to see these promises come to pass. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. See, that's a curse. Means you're going to be fruitful. You're not going to have barrenness. In the number of thy days, I will fulfill. That means you're going to have a long life. Praise God. You're not going to be cut off short. He goes on in verse 30. He says, by little and little, I'll drive them out from before thee. These are all the ites, which are type of you casting all the spirits out that have all come in from inheritance, your own sins or victimization, until thou be increased, which means to bear fruit. It is a Hebrew word, para, meaning to bear fruit, and inherit the land. So we see a lot of things that are brought forth here. He wants us to obey his voice. He wants us to do all the things he speaks. He wants us to be one who's going to serve him. He wants, to be, he wants us to be ones that are going to drive out all these enemies and bring forth fruit in our life so then we can possess our inherited promises in our life. Exodus chapter 32, down here in verse 29. These are all principles, conditions that are important for you to see God's blessings come forth in your life. Exodus 32, 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Then every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. You consecrate yourself unto the Lord. You fill yourself up with the things of God. You separate yourself that you're going to walk in his ways. God will bring his blessings upon you. Deuteronomy chapter 2, down here in verse 7. He says this, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. What was the wilderness? It was the time of testing, proving, to find out whether they'd walk in his ways, whether they'd really love the Lord, whether they'd obey him, do all the things that he told them to do. He knows you're walking through your spiritual wilderness, which every one of us are being tested as we're going on to possess the promised land. These 40 years, the number of testing says, The Lord thy God hath been with thee, and thou hast lacked nothing. As you are walking in being tested, God will meet every need in your life. You will lack nothing. That's a blessing. But you know, we do have to walk the walk. We've got to pass the tests in our life. If we think that we're going to just walk any way we want, walk in sin and walk in the flesh, and have one foot in the flesh and one foot in God, and think that we're going to get anywhere, it's not going to happen. See, God wants to bless us. But at the same time, we have to come in line with his word and meet the conditions. In Numbers, chapter 22, 
Numbers chapter 22, we see over here in verse 6. Here's where it's talking here about Bala and Balak. He says, Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. He wanted Balaam to curse the people. For they're too mighty for me. For adventure I shall prevail that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land. For what, for I what, that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and him who thou cursest is cursed. Otherwise, he saw, you know, whoever, whatever you speak is coming to pass. Well, verse 12, God said to Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. We aren't going to curse people. We're going to, of course, in the New Testament, we're not going to curse anybody. We're going to bless everybody. But here, he said, you're not going to curse these people. They are a blessed people. Then we see over in, in chapter 23, picking up in verse 11. It goes on and says, Balak said to Balaam, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them all together. He was mad about it. You've been blessing them instead of cursing them. Well, his response was, Behold, I've received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He followed the command of the Lord. That's what you need to do. Follow the commands of the Lord. What are we supposed to do in the New Testament? We're supposed to bless and curse not. We're supposed to love our enemies. Bless those that curse us. Do good to those that have done evil to us. Uh, you're going to pray for those that persecute you and use you. Otherwise, we are going to give out what people have need of. We're not going to judge them and respond according to what they might deserve. God is the judge. Remember, he says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, in verse 25, Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. He didn't want them to do anything. No. What God says to do, we're going to do. He obeyed God's command. He blessed them. And it's important that you and I do the same thing. We can't be cursing people and think that we're going to see blessings come forth. You try to curse somebody, you speak negatives against them, you're going to see curses come upon you. You need to bless and be a blessing to others. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we see over here in verse 12. Deuteronomy 7 verse 12, It shall come to pass, wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments. Hearken means to listen, listen and obey. We've got to have an ear to listen to God. And listen to his word, listen to his voice. And keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. Notice that. If you hearken, keep, and do, then he's going to keep his covenant and mercy. That means God's not automatically keeping covenant and mercy. He's doing it when the conditions are met. Everybody thinks, well, God has ought to automatically do these things. No, it doesn't work that way. You are in a covenant relationship with Him. As you do your part, then you will absolutely know that God will do His part, and He will carry it out. He'll love thee. This is the blessing that will come. You know, He's going to keep His covenant, His mercy. He says He's going to love you. He's going to bless you. He, doesn't, he says, I love those that love me. A lot of people assume that He loves everybody. No, it doesn't say that. It says, I love those that love me. I love, he'll love you and bless you and multiply. He'll bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land and the corn, wine, thine oil, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. God's going to, when you do something that God tells you to do, his blessing is going to come across the board in all areas of your life. Neither shall you, thou, thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. God doesn't cause barrenness. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. God will free you from sickness. Many people don't understand that there are conditions for you to be able to receive the blessings of, the, of, of healing and deliverance and all the things that God promises us in the Word of God. And He will take away sickness if we meet the conditions. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. A curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Now some people think, well, I thought, well, Christ redeemed us from the curse of law. That means I can't have any curses. That's not so. You will get a curse if you walk in the ways of sin. The redeemed from the curse of the law means that now we can do something about the curse. They couldn't do anything about it in the Old Testament. 
Now we can do something and break those curses. Not that you can't be cursed. You can be cursed. You walk in sin, curses will come. What's a curse? Sickness and disease is a curse. Can we be sick? Sure. Poverty is a curse. All kinds of calamities are curses. So don't think that the fact that Christ redeeming you from the curse of law means you can't be cursed. It means now you can do something about the curse to break it in your life. Not that you can't be. People miss that, unfortunately. They have a tendency to think that, well, that means I can't be cursed at all. Well, if they just look at the Word of God and realize it's talking about sickness, disease, poverty, hindrances, all kinds of negative things going on, and obviously they're happening not just in the world, but they're happening in the lives of Christians. That tells you the curse is at work. We do, we're, going to we're going to choose to obey what he says to do. A curse if you'll not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 12, over in verse 6. Thither you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, your tithes, and heave offerings to your hand, your vows, your free will offerings, the firstlings of your herds and your flocks. This is all of our offerings unto the Lord, bringing of our tithes and offerings to Him. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. He sh you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto, you and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. That means as you're a tither, God's going to bless you. He's going to bless your household. He's going to bring good things upon you. We see this again brought out in Deuteronomy chapter 14, down here in verse 28 where he says, At the end of the three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thy increase the same year, and shall lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance of thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and eat, and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. In the Old Testament, they brought the tithes into the storehouse, into the treasury, for the Levites, and for the strangers, and for the fatherless, and for the widows to be ministered to. If you obey, then the blessings would come upon the work of their hands, what they were doing. God will bless the work of the hands. That's why we got to, the same thing is true today. Jesus takes those, ministers them before the Father, and what's He going to do? He's going to look down from His holy habitation. He's going to pour His blessings upon us. It's going to bring forth blessings upon all the work of your hand that you do as well. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 4. He says, Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance to possess it. Only if, here's the if, thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. Now, notice that, to carefully hearken, otherwise be sure that you're carrying these out. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee. It's a promise, but it's not automatic. Promises are what He will do for you. They're guaranteed if you meet the conditions. You'll lend into many nations. You shall not borrow. Thou shalt reign over many nations, and they shall not reign over you. We see something else in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 20. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury. Usury is talking about interest. But unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury or interest. We're not supposed to take advantage of our brother and sister. You lend to them, you don't lend with interest. You lend to them, and then they just repay you back. That the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Many Christians and many ministries have really missed it on this one because they have actually taken advantage of the Christians and lent them with interest, and that was a no-no. They should not have been doing that and making a mistake violating the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1. It shall be when thou art come in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance and possesseth and dwellest therein, that they shall take of the first of all the fruit of the earth and shall bring in the, of the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall put it in a basket and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. And you go into the priest that shall be in those days. Talking here, a type of Jesus the high priest. And you say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, I'm coming to the country that the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. That's a type of you coming into being born again, having a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And who is the priest in these days? It's Jesus. What does he do with your tithes and offerings? He sets it before the Father. And so, then we see down in verse 10. Oops wrong way. Down in verse 10, 
Now, behold, I brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and I set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. You see, why do I pray the prayers that I pray when we're taking the offering? I'm just not just praying religious prayers. I'm praying the Word, speaking forth the Word of what we're doing, and then declaring what God is doing for you, speaking the blessings into being. That we set it before the Lord, and we worship before the Lord our God. We're worshiping Him, see? And he says here, that when he made an end of all, tithing all the tithes of thine, increase the third year, the year of tithing, and giving it to Levite, stranger, fatherless, widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Then he talked about how he brought all the hallowed things out of his house. And he says in verse 14, how he had not eaten thereof in my morning, neither have taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, didn't take anything for uncleanness, or given aught thereof for the dead, but I've hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that he's commanded me. Then what? Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven. Otherwise, all these things were conditions before they could declare, look down from your holy habitation and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us as thou swearest unto our fathers a land that floweth with milk and honey. As you bring your tithes, then you see that Jesus takes them and sets them before the Father and worships him. And then, as you're obedient in doing all that he says, then he will open up those windows of heaven, looking down from his holy habitation, pouring out his blessings upon us. In Deuteronomy 28, it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently, this is hearkening diligently, we need, this is showing not just casual doing whenever we feel like it. One of the things we see in the American church, in the Western church, is people just have a tendency just to do whatever they want, whenever they want. That doesn't work with God. His word doesn't change. He expects us to walk in his ways and be obedient in all things and follow him. Be totally in submission to him. Put, make him Lord. Be and put him first place in our life. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, the Lord will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Notice this. It says the blessings will come on you and overtake you. If they're going to overtake you, that means you can't even get away from them. They're going to come and get you. They're going to come and get you. The blessings will show up. But you know the opposite is true. You disobey, the curses will come on you and overtake you. You can't get away from them either. That's why you've got to realize God will make sure that the blessings come to you. They will come and they will get you. He knows your address. He knows where you are. He knows how to get his blessings unto you and they will come and overtake you in your life as you obey, but we need to be doing the things that he says. And we see down in verse 9 again, part in the midst of these blessings he's listing. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. See, we got these little ifs along the way. Verse 13. The Lord will make thee the head and not the tail. She'll be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. Everybody likes to confess that one. How about the rest of the verse? Well, they kind of forgot that part or didn't want to think about it. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command you this day to observe and to do them, there are conditions for you to be the head and not the tail and above and not beneath. It is not automatic as we see. He said, you can't go aside from any of these words I command you this day to the right hand or the left to go after other gods to serve them, which is what we end up doing, looking to something else as a source. But it will come to pass if you'll not hearken to the voice of the Lord, I like God to observe and do all his commandments and statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses will come on you and they will get you, they will overtake you, and you cannot get away from them. That's why we want to be sure we're doing the right thing. And then we know what God's going to do. He will, of course, do the right thing, and his blessings will come our way. Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. We've got to love him. Who loves him? He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. He does the half my, half my words, and he's keeping them and doing them. That's the one that loves him. Walk in his ways, keep his commandments, statutes, judgments, that you mightest live and multiply, that the Lord thy God will bless thee in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. We see this over and over and over. Why does he keep saying it over and over and over? He's trying to drill it into us that we need to be hearkening diligently unto him, loving the Lord, walking his ways, keeping his commandments, doing all of these things. In 2 Samuel, 
chapter 6, verse 11. The ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, he was a knight, a Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Wherever the presence of God is, means something's going to be blessed. Well, that's what's supposed to happen for you. It was told King David, saying, The Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertained unto him because of the ark of God. Well, the ark of God was the place where God's presence was manifest. You say, well, I'm, I got the presence of God in me because I'm born again, but is he manifest in you? He's not, he might be shut down because we're not walking in his ways. If the ma manifest presence of God is coming forth in your life because you're doing his word, you're praying, you're praying in tongues, you're praying it causes the filling of the spirit, you're doing his word, you're carrying out what he says, and you see the manifest presence of God. You're praising and worshiping Him, speaking His Word, doing what He says. What's going to happen? Then the presence of God manifest in you will cause the blessing of God to come upon your house. Psalms 1.1 Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We will not be blessed if we walk in ungodly counsel. Why would we want to get any counsel from the world or anybody that is not walking right before the Lord? You've got to be sure that you're getting things from the Word of God. Nor stands in the way of sinners. You've got to stay away from sinners in the way of sin. And sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Well, those are the ones that they got their negative speech going. They're the critical ones, the judgmental, the ones that are down in the mouth and so forth. Get away from them. You don't want to be around those types at all. His delight is in the law of the Lord. This guy is going to be blessed, see? And his law, does he meditate day and night? That means the Word of God is what you're thinking on, what you're meditating on, what you're, you're setting your whole day, and whatever comes up, this is what we're going to do. We're going to think on the Word. We're going to choose the Word. What does the Word say that I should do? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Fruit's going to come forth in its season. Remember, it's first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. It's a process of bringing forth fruit. His leaf shall not wither. That means you're not going to wither as you're going along. No, you're going to bring forth that fruit. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God wants you to prosper in everything that you do. He wants you to get the victory in everything that you do. Not win a few, lose a few. No, God doesn't lose any. He wins them all. And if we're doing what he says, we can win every battle. We can prosper in everything that we do as long as we're following him and obeying him. Psalms 2, verse 12, he tells us something else. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We need to trust in the Lord. And not just say it out of one corner of our mouth and then go and act a different way. No, if you really trust in the Lord, you're going to pray his word. You're going to do his word. You're going to carry out what he says, and you're going to speak forth his, what he promises declare, and you know he's going to bring it to pass. And you're not going to try an alternative way over here. No, you're going to do what God says. You know that you have your trust in the Lord, and he's going to bring his promises to pass in your life. Psalms 3, verse 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Well, all these thousands of people are all type of the thousands of demons that are out there that are trying to work against the, uh, the whole body of Christ. Don't be afraid of the devils. Don't ever be afraid of the devil. God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can conquer every devil, every work of the enemy that's against you. He goes on and says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. That's right. God's your Savior. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. His blessing will be upon his people. But what do we got to do? We can't be afraid. You got to be ready to take on these devils. He told you to cast out the demons. He told you to resist the devil. He told you to come against these spirits in the heavenlies. Any of these so-called prophets out there in the body of Christ, and I've heard them all, heard them the different ones, saying, oh, we're, we're supposed to just pray and let God do things and not enter into the spiritual warfare, binding, loosing, engaging in the warfare in the heavenlies. Don't even listen to them for a minute. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities. Who does it? We do. 
You are to engage in the warfare. He's given you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens. Whatsoever you bind on earth, we shall be having been bound in the heavens, literally. It's what it says in Matthew 16, 19. And we can loose, untie as well. We need to get into the warfare. Psalms 5, over here in verse 12. Thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. We've got to be the righteous. Remember that righteousness is more than just being born again. When you receive Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior, you get a spirit that's right with him. <clears throat> but it's more than just being born again. <clears throat> because what happens when you sin? Unrighteousness gets upon you. That's why you've got to confess your sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from what? All unrighteousness. And remember what 1 John chapter 3 says. Verse 7 says, this is a scripture that many people have a tendency to leave out when they're talking about righteousness. I don't know why. It seems to be a pretty important scripture to the Lord because he says, little children, let no man deceive you. He's warning you. Don't be deceived here now about this subject. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He expects us to do his word of righteousness. The word doeth, by the way, isn't the fact that I did it once. No, it happens to be in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated action. Is doing righteousness. We're righteous in spirit when we're born again, and now we are to do his word of righteousness so we stay righteous. We can't be walking in sin and think that God's blessings are going to come upon us. They're not going to happen. These are all important things. Psalms 24. You see, so many people out there have not taught the truth about all the conditions that are necessary for God's blessings in our life. Proverbs 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Well, that means, obviously, not everybody. It's going to be some people that are meeting the conditions. He that hath clean hands, a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, or made an oath deceitfully, and not carried it out. That's what that's talking about. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who's going to get the blessing? The one who meets the conditions. The one who has a clean hands and pure heart, not lifted up a soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully. That's the one that's going to ascend in the hill of the Lord, and that's talking about Mount Zion. Zion is coming up to the place of having conquered all the enemies and come to the place of being delivered and holy and possessing your promises in your life. And you're going to be able to stand in the presence of God and see the blessings come upon you in your life. Over in Psalms 32, Blessed is he whose transgressions forgiven, whose sin is covered. That was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, is our sin covered? No, it's washed away by the blood of Jesus. Our sin isn't covered anymore. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there's no guile. See, we can get our sins, or we confess our sins. He'll cleanse us from all of this. And we're not going to have any guile, which refers to deceit. Deceit is really what this is referring to, deceitfulness in ourselves. No. We're going to be sure we're going to be genuine. We're going to walk in the ways of the Lord. What's the problem we have in this nation? Why has this nation not been going in the right direction? Well, the Word of God says in Psalms 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. What happens to a nation that decides to take God out of the schools, prayer out of the schools, that wants to allow homosexuality, that wants to allow uh, abortion, that wants to allow and take all this and anything about the Word of God off, you know, get the Ten Commandments, and anything that mentions the Word of God off? Are they going to be a blessed nation? No. What do we see? Our nation has gone downhill. That's why there's only one answer. It is coming back to God and restoration of righteousness so that God can once again bring the blessing that he purposes. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And who's the ones that he chooses? The ones that respond to the call. Remember, many are called, but few are chosen. Just because you're called doesn't mean you're chosen. You've got to do the word and respond to everything he says, or you're not going to be chosen. But those who are chosen, those are the ones that have obeyed him and respond to the call of God and are walking in the ways of the Lord. Psalms 34, over here in verse 8. We see another principle. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. He is full of goodness and mercy and blessing. He is your healer, your savior, your deliverer, your peace, your prosperer, your, the one who wants to give great blessings in your life. 
Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. We've got to trust in him. Real trust in him is really seeking him that he's your hope, he's your confidence, he's your refuge, he's your all in all. It's not just saying, well, I trust in the Lord and then go act a different way. The question is, if you say you're trusting the Lord, are you thinking, speaking, and acting in line with what you say you're trusting in? See, many people say one thing and then go and do another. No, your actions show it for your faith. Faith without works is dead. It's not working. It's not going to produce in your life. Psalms 40, verse 4. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. God does not want you to respect the proud. God doesn't respect the proud. He hates the proud. He hates pride. Gives grace to the humble. Resists the proud. You don't want to have respect to the proud either. You know, we're, we're going to pray for people, but we're not going to have respect to people that are, walk around in pride. A lot of people in the body of Christ have not gotten rid of their pride. But you've got to get rid of that pride. That's what caused the devil to fall, and it will cause continual falls in your life or anybody that turns aside the lies, anything that's contrary to the Word of God, they're not walking in the ways of the Word. That's why we've got to know the Word, put the Word first place, hear and do the Word of God. Psalms 41, we see something else in verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. You consider the poor, God will come in your time of trouble and deliver you. You ignore the poor, you've got problems. Many a curse will come to those that ignore the poor, it says. The Lord will preserve him, keep him alive. He shall be blessed upon the earth and will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. See, God wants us to give out. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He wants you to be a giver. What can you do to give out, to minister to people's needs, especially those that are poor? Psalms 45, <clears throat> verse 1. My heart is indicting a matter, a good matter. I speak of the things that I've made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. What does that mean? Your tongue is like the pen, a marking stick, something that writes, of a ready writer, that's a skillful scribe, who's writing things. That means what you're speaking with your mouth is being written in the Spirit. It's being recorded in the Spirit. God knows everything that you've ever spoke. Your words are important. And what's the next verse say? Thou art fair in the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips, which be what? The word of God, the word of his grace. Therefore God hath blessed thee for ever. That's a long time. That's a good promise. Your words are important. You can't say, I'm believing for such and such, and pray a prayer, and then go forth and speak a bunch of negatives. No. You pour grace into your lips, and you speak forth his word, and his word is all you're going to speak forth and keep declaring, speaking to decrees, declaring decrees to bring these things into being. What's going to happen? You pour grace in your lips, God's going to bless you forever because your tongue is writing things in the realm of the Spirit. It is being recorded. Over in Psalms 65, Psalm 65, we see in verse 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Now here again, blessed is the man that thou choosest. Who's he choosing? The one who's responding to the call of God. And what's he going to do? Cause him to approach unto thee. Now what can we do? We can draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to us. We can come into the very presence of God. The way in the holiest is open to us. We can now come boldly to the throne of grace, take hold of his mercy, find grace to help in time of need. We'll be satisfied. We'll dwell in the courts. We'll be satisfied with the goodness of the house of the Lord, even of thy holy temple. God wants to bring that forth. But we've got to be one who meets the conditions so his blessings can come upon us in our life. Psalms 84, we see in verse 4. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will, still, will be still praising thee. Those that dwell in the house, be praising God, manifesting the presence of God, praising and worshiping him. That's why the Bible says we're to offer up the sacrifice of praise continually, the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. Not just once in a while. Do you praise him through your week? Do you praise him through your day? David said seven times a day, do I praise the Lord? Are you praising him and worshiping him? Or has it only become a thing when you come to church? Oh, we praise Him when we come together corporately, but we should be praising Him individually throughout your day. 
praising and worshiping the Lord. He wants you to minister to him. Blessed is the man whose strength is in him, and whose hearts are the ways of them. What's in your heart? The ways of the Lord. That's why we got to guard our heart. You get the word in your heart. You keep the word in your heart. You don't let the devil come and take it out of your heart. You got to keep your heart with all diligence, because out of its flow in the issues, the outgoings of life, it comes forth out of you, as it says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. So, we need to be sure that we are guarding our heart. And in verse 12, he says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. You trust in the Lord, and what's he going to do? He's not going to withhold anything from you. Because the Lord God is a sun and shield who gives grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly. That's the one who's walking in his ways and trusting in him. God is going to bring his blessings to pass in your life. Praise God. Psalms 89, verse 15. Many scriptures showing important things for us in order to see his blessings. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound of rejoicing, praising God, just excited about the Lord, ministering unto him. We shouldn't be depressed, down, discouraged, negative, all these kind of things. That's something that's so engulfed in their circumstances and, and all these negatives. You need to be rejoicing. In fact, when it talks about this joyful sound, it's really talking about those that are just shouting with joy. They're just blessing God. They're just praising God. They are great rejoicing, essentially. That know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. That's why the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice in Philippians. Which, you remember, was when, jail, when uh, Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail. It looked like it was all over for their ministry. What'd they do? They rejoiced in the Lord. They weren't going to give place to the devil. And they, were kept, they kept praying. And what happened? God you know, caused that earthquake, opened up the, the, the uh, doors of the jail. They, of course, get out. The jailer gets saved, him and his house. God moves. They were preaching the gospel and praying. That's why they knew, well, sir, what should I do to be saved? Because they heard him preaching. They didn't get all down, discouraged, and so forth. They were about the master's business. They weren't in the flesh. They weren't in self. They were into what God wanted. See, that's where God wants us to come to. He wants us to come out of self, the place where we're going to walk in his way so he can bring his blessings upon you. Psalms 94. See, the blessings come from you walk in the Spirit. Psalms 94, verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. We have to be willing to be chastened, to be corrected. Every one of us are going to receive instruction and correction. We need to be corrected. Again, I've seen people that, they, there's some people out there, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, they go to a church where they find, find some that everything agrees with me. And once they hear some that doesn't agree with me, well, I don't like hearing that one, they're going to, because they don't want to hear particular things. You don't come to church to, quote, find something that agrees with me. You come to church to receive the Word of God, for God to minister to you and to work in your life, and that includes the chastening, correction of the Lord. And you always should have your repentance shoes on at all times, ready to repent, change, turn, ready to deal with things in our life. And teaches him out of the law. We've got to be teachable, got to hear his Word, we've got to be willing to be chastened and corrected so we can be partakers of his holiness. Over in Psalms 106, verse 3, Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. We've got to keep his judgment, his judgments, the things that he says, according to his ways, his, what, his statements of what he says to do, and also doing righteousness at all times. It means we can't be walking our own ways. We can't walk in unrighteousness, that's for sure. In Psalms 112, it says in verse 1, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. You want to be blessed? You've got to have the fear of God before you. The fear of God is to hate evil, Proverbs 8, verse 13. If you hate evil, it's the last thing that you're going to be allowed to come into your life. You're not going to speak evil. You're not going to think on evil. You're not going to be looking at evil. You're not going to be hearing evil. You're not going to be doing evil. You're going to stay away from it. That delighteth greatly in his commandments. We're going to delight greatly in the commandments of the Lord. God's commandments are given to us so we don't give place to the enemy. We walk in his ways so God can bring his blessings. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. Have the fear of God before you. Delight greatly in the commandments of the Lord. What's going to happen? His seed will be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright, because he's upright, he's going to be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness will endure forever. 
Under the upper right, there arises a light and darkness. He's gracious, full of compassion and righteous. And the good man shows favor and lends, and he guides his affairs with discretion. He will not be moved forever. Nothing moves him because he's trusted in the Lord. The righteous will be an everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. You cannot have fear and think you're going to see God's blessings. His heart is fixed, stable, firm, trusting in the Lord. Nothing's going to move me because I know what God's going to do in performing His Word. We're talking about absolute confidence in God. His heart's established, not wavering, wondering, which way, wishy-washy and so forth. No, your heart's established. You're not wavering. Remember the guy that wavers? He can't receive anything of the Lord. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. You're going to stay at conquering these enemies until they're underfoot. You're going to keep on casting out. You're going to keep on speaking the word. You're going to keep on praying. You're going to keep on doing what he says until you see those enemies smitten and put underfoot in your life. And God will bring it forth. Hallelujah. Psalms 115, over here in verse 11. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. You got the fear of God? We got to trust in Him as our help and our shield. Don't look to all these other things. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. Why is the mindful of us? Why is the Lord mindful of us? Because we're fearing the Lord, because we're trusting in Him. We're looking to Him as our source. He's a jealous God, remember. He's not going to have any other gods before Him. He's been mindful of us. He'll bless us. He'll bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. He'll bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord will increase you more and more, you and your children. That's pretty good. We need to be meeting the conditions, fearing the Lord, trusting Him as our help and our shield so we can get blessed and increased. Psalms 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. What kind of a walk do you have? We just brought forth a message, a couple messages on how we walk with God, how to walk with God and saw many principles, very important, shown in the Word for how you walk with God. You just can't walk whatever we want and think, well, I'm walking with God because he's, He certainly must be with me. No, you walk with God when you do what He says. Undefiled in the way, walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies, that seek Him with a whole heart. Not casual seeking, not kind of halfway, half-hearted. Your whole heart. It's your whole being is put into seeking after the Lord. Are you seeking the Lord with your whole heart? Or are you just trying to, you know, get, get, get him to do something when I have a need, you know? The old push-button God type of idea. And then the rest of the time, kind of just doing our own thing. It's not going to happen. If you seek God with your whole heart all the time, God will be there in your time of trouble and there to minister and lead you and guide you and meet your needs and prosper you and bless you and bring everything that he purposes. They also shall do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. That is the ones that are going to be blessed. Psalms 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord. Here it is a fear in the Lord again and walks in his ways. Your walk, very important. You're going to eat the labor of thine hands. That shows you might not eat the labor of your hands because remember the curse is you don't eat the labor of your hands. Somebody eats it up. It's the old so much reap little curse out of Deuteronomy 28, 38. That's a curse. I've been sowing a whole lot, not reaping it. What's happening? That's because of disobedience. Well, I should automatically reap all these things because I sowed it. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, read Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 and following. You see all the curses. Verse 38 talks about the so much reap little curse. Many people didn't even know there was one. A lot of people have been sowing a lot of things and wonder, why aren't I reaping? Because... The enemy has been able to have place. You'll eat the labor of your hands if you're fearing the Lord and walk in his ways. Happy shalt thou be. You'll be blessed, this means. And it shall be well with thee. We like that. Your wife will be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. That's good. Husbands, right? Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. They're fruitful as well. We like that too. We don't want to have problems in the children. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. What does God want? He wants us to fear the Lord. Psalms 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant is it for brethren to dwell in unity. He wants the body of Christ to be in unity. One accord, one soul, one mind, one mouth, one common vision, speaking the word, walking the word, doing the word, 
following these ways. That's why people, if they're not in unity in one accord in a church, they're not going to be around for long, I guarantee you. And we've seen that happen, unfortunately. Because they don't want to be in one accord with God's word, they just want to do what they want to do. That's a problem in the entire body of Christ, churches worldwide. How good is it for brethren to dwell together in unity? We're to come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. We're to be one. That's why Jesus said, pray that they might be one just as we are one. Talking to the Father. That was his high priestly prayer in John 17. He wants us to come to the place of being one with him. And you're not just one with him just because you're born again. It's because you're walking in his ways. You're speaking. You're having the same words and thoughts and motivations and attitudes. We're coming in line. And that's what he wants. See? It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Herod's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there, where is he talking about? He's talking about the ones that are dwelling in unity. There, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. See, we're going to be in unity with the Lord. We're going to be unity one to another. We're, going to, we're like a family. We're going to come to the place of one accord, one mouth, one, we're doing everything in line with his ways. And what's he do? He's going to command the blessing, even life forevermore. Psalms 134, in verse 3, verse three he says this. The Lord hath made heaven, let's back up for a moment. He says, Behold, ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. We need to be praisers and worshipers of God. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. Zion in Scripture, and we're going to do a message some, some here shortly, on coming up to spiritual Zion. Zion is the picture of the one who's come up to the mount, having overcome the enemies in their life and walking in the things of God, having been delivered, having come to the place of being holy and possessing the promises, coming up to the mount. That's all what it's a picture of. The Lord will bless thee out of Zion. In the measure that you've come out of bondage in your life is the measure that the blessings of God will come unto you. And of course, they come out of the, the heavenly Zion to those that have come into the Zion in their life of overcoming and conquering the enemies. Proverbs 3, 3 we'll look at one last scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. He says this, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. Some people think there isn't a curse of the Lord. There is. It's in the word of God. Right here as well. When you don't obey, curses come upon you. His word has said it. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. But the, he blesseth the habitation of the just. Who are the just? The righteous. The righteous. That's why our walk is so important in our life. As you walk righteous before him, as you're obedient, in all the things that God tells you to do, what's going to happen? You are going to be blessed, praise God, and he'll bring forth great things in your life. We talked about a lot of things, and we're going to pick up tonight because we've got a lot to talk about as we're going through this series. We're going to pick up here and continue on as we go through the rest of the Old Testament into the New Testament, looking at conditions, and then we'll be moving on into the rewards and the blessings, the specific blessings that we've seen some of them as we've gone, that we'll see the blessings that God brings forth. And of course, all these are like conditions for the blessings to come forth in our life. And we'll be talking about that as we go through this series. So what we've seen today is God's the blesser. We've got to hear his word. We've got to learn of his ways so we can walk in his ways. Remember, we're Abraham's seed, heirs of the, pro of the blessings promised us. All the blessings of Abraham belong to us in Christ. We have all these spiritual blessings. They're all spiritual blessings we're supposed to enter into. And as we carry out what he says and all these principles that we brought out, we sacrifice to God in worship. We're obedient to his word. We don't go in the way of the world. We obey his voice. We keep his commandments. We don't walk in fear. We don't take a wife from the world or unbelievers. We learn by our experience and act, walking in the word. We're a Nazarite, consecrated, devoted to him. We obey his voice. We pass his spiritual tests. We hearken diligently, keep his commands, do his word, walk in his ways. We're tithers. We don't lend to our brother with interest to fleece our brother. We love the Lord. We have the presence of God manifest in us as we do the word. We delight in the word night and day. We don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or the way of sinners or be a scornful mouth speaking negative things. We trust in the Lord. 
We're going to be righteous with clean hands, a pure heart, not lifting up our soul to vanity or swear or vow deceitfully. We're going to confess our sins. We're not going to respect the proud or turn aside to those of lies. We're going to pour grace into our lips. We're going to answer the call of God so we're chosen. We're going to dwell in His presence and our ways are going to keep, be kept in our heart. We're going to know the joyful sound. We're going to walk in the light of His countenance. We're going to receive His chasing and be taught of the Lord. We're going to keep His judgments and do righteousness at all times. We're going to fear the Lord. We're going to delight greatly in His commandments. We're going to be upright and undefiled. We're going to keep His testimonies and seek the whole, seek them with our whole heart and do no iniquity and dwell in unity. And we're going to come up to spiritual Zion having conquered the Lord and we are going to walk in His ways as the righteous. Heavenly Father, say this to me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank You for Your Word. It is the truth. I thank You for Your blessings that will absolutely come upon me in every area of my life as I meet your conditions. I will be a doer of the word and I thank you for your blessings coming on me and overtaking me in every area of my life. Thank you for your blessings coming on me in my life as I'm a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we're going to pick up here, as we mentioned, and continue on and talk about more of the conditions, and it's so important that we understand all these things, because as we see all these conditions, and we see, we may, you may have seen some things come along as we're going through that, hey, I, I haven't been walking this way, and I'm hindering blessings because I haven't been doing the Word in these areas. We need to be doing the Word. You meet the conditions, God will absolutely perform His Word. You can absolutely trust His Word and know that He will bring it to pass in your life. Father, we thank You and praise You for Your Word. It is the truth. We received it this day. It's written in our heart and mind. We will take hold of it. We will do it. We will see Your blessings come forth. We know that You're a performer of Your Word. We rejoice and we praise You and thank You for the blessings You've already brought. And we thank You that we are going to see all Your blessings come on us and overtake us as we're hearers and doers of Your Word. In Jesus' name, there'll be much fruit from this message. And we praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you. If you need prayer.